go ahead. Okay, we also have just um, as spectators here, we have uh, <laughs> Professor Sandy Smith. She's actually the director of the Institute of Forest Conservation. And we have Paul and Tony here who are our everything. They do all <laughs> our field camps. They do all our labs, all our technical stuff. Um, so logistics. Logistics, make you sure name it. Works. it. <laughs> make, make sure everything functions. So again, if you have questions about field camps, they can answer anything to do with that. So I'll try and go through this fairly quickly. Um, there we go. So this is just um, a slide maybe for you guys to just read to yourselves, but these are sort of the, the reasons that we hear from students as to why, um, why they think about coming into the MFC program. And um, really a lot of our students, whether they have a Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Arts, they come out of their four year degree and say, okay, what do I do now? What kind of job can I get? Um, most of our students or all of our students are students that want to make a difference. They want to do something positive for the world, uh, make it a better place. And those are some of the themes that run through our student body. But hopefully they, um, these uh, concerns are addressed in the program because we feel that our students do make a contribution when they come out. And uh, we're happy to discuss what our alumni are doing as well right now. So if you want to speak about that after, we certainly can. Um, the other thing is uh, many of the people that come into the program want to spend some time outdoors during their career. Uh, being a, a graduate of our program doesn't mean you have to be outside for your career. You could be um, absolutely in an office um, working for the government. Uh, many of those jobs you go out occasionally, but you're doing policy work, so you're working in an office. So it doesn't mean you have to be a, a you know, 24 seven field uh, person. So just a bit of background about who we are. We were the first, we are the first forestry faculty in Canada, started in 1907, um, over 4,000 alumni, which is really important to our students because it gives them a lot of opportunity for networking. So if you wanna work for the government or you wanna intern with the government, we're sure to have contacts there. If you want to work for World Wildlife Foundation, or you want to work up north at Tenbeck, one of the forest industries, uh, we have contacts that we can help with. So that's where our alumni come in and make it um, make the program more successful. Um, just generally, many of you may know that we have courses and uh, programs in the undergrad in arts and science. We have um, undergrad in forest conservation. Are any of you taking a minor or major in minor, minor in the arts or the science? Uh, art. Okay, so we have both um, a BA minor and we have a BSc minor in forest conservation. As well, we have a BSc uh, major and minor in forest biomaterials, which is more looking at wood products and making interesting things out of wood. Um, in 2019, we actually became uh, amalgamated or merged with uh, the Faculty of Architecture, which is across Spadina, at number one Spadina. I don't know if you has anybody ever visited that building? It's kind of a neat building. Um, the so, circle. Yeah, they just call in it the middle circle. of the circle. Yeah. So it's uh, it's been uh, an interesting um, learning curve, both good and bad. I'd say mainly good. Uh, these things take time to work themselves out. But um, I think we're, we're fairly happy that we landed there, that we're working with uh, architecture people and land with, uh, architecture people as well right now. Um, the MFC program itself is in its 25th cohort. So we've been around for a long time. Our, um, we've been here a lot longer than any of these sort of Master of Environment programs that have sort of all recently uh, jumped up. There's probably half dozen at UFT now, um, but obviously we were doing this for a long time, for 25 years already. Um, 
the big change to our program came in 2014, where we became accredited as a uh, professional school. So what that means is that our program enables you to become a professional um, forester, so a registered professional forester. And that's important, um, and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, some students come here because of that specifically. They want to get that designation, and others come for the program because they're more interested in what the program has to offer. So we have students sort of in, in both schools. Okay. So what is a professional program? I don't think that's just green too, right? Oh, there. Okay. So um, a professional um, program or a profession is something, if you think of nursing or a doctor or a dentist, they have to go through schooling um, according to a governing body. The governing body decides what skills and knowledge those people need to become a dentist. So similar for forestry, you need to go through a school or a program that is accredited by the Canadian, what are they called? Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board. And they tell us what we need to include in our curriculum so that our students, when they come out, can be registered professional foresters. So what does it mean to you as a professional forester, if that's the route you choose to take? Uh, it means you can practice forestry in Canada or the province of Ontario more specifically for our program. And what does forestry mean? What, what, is, what is it that you're allowed to do under the regulations of the provincial government? If you're reading quotes, it includes anything to do with the development, management, conservation, and sustainability of forests, including urban forests, which require post-secondary education and experience um, in other words, professional expertise and judgment. So if you are not an RPF, you are not allowed to do those activities in the province of Ontario. So our, our program gives you a certain set of knowledge and skills um, to attain that uh, accredit or to become registered. In addition to that, in addition to the program, you need to have 18 months of experience working under a professional forester. So you need to have a mentor and work at the profession for 18 months. The program, if you complete our program, you get five months credit for that 18 months. So you actually only have to um, work another 13 months under a professional forester. Okay, Are there any questions around that? Yeah. No. Okay, so why is it important to become a professional forester? Well, it really opens up the job market for you because um, similar to other professions, you are required to have this um, uh, registration before you can practice forestry. It also <clears throat> uh, enables you to have a network of um, professionals as mentors, as um, you know, as co-workers, but it really expands your network and allows you to uh, find employment and um, you know be successful in your career. So I think that's a big part of it. The profession is small in a way. There's not a lot of schools that can you can go to to become a professional forester. So the people out there seem to get to know one another very quickly and becoming a professional enables you to interact with that uh, network. Okay, so this our program is designed really with a few different uh, uh, criteria in mind. First of all, we want to make sure you get the fundamental knowledge of forestry or forest conservation. Um, but in addition to that knowledge, we want to generate uh, or make sure that our students are problem solvers, excellent communicators, um, can critically think, can critically um, integrate different ideas. And um, the other thing is to be able to work successfully in teams. Um, these are all skills that you need in a 
um, a variety of careers now, um, not just forestry, but forestry especially, you need to solve problems. That's really what forest conservation is about. And you need to work with different stakeholders. Um, forestry involves everything from the person whose front yard the tree is sitting on um, to the people who are going to um, put up the uh, hydro wires above it to the people who are planting those trees from the city. Um, so there's just a myriad of stakeholders that you deal with in forestry. When you look up north, you deal with industries, you deal with indigenous people, um, you deal with small communities. So there's really just, uh, we try to bring all these facets into the program so that our students are excellent at communicating and getting, um, getting consensus on a lot of very difficult issues. So a little bit more specific about uh, the MFC program, just to give you an idea of some of the sort of aspects of forest conservation that you would be uh, looking at and working in. We have professors that are sort of specialized in, in each one of those areas, and they're the ones who are, of course, teaching the courses. Um, some of the benefits or, or things that students like about our program, first of all, it's a small class size. Our cohorts are at most 30. They're, that's our max. Um, normally, they're around 25. This year, it's a specially small class. It's around 18. So I think that's a huge advantage. You get to know your cohort really well. Um, you literally make lifelong friends. If you talk to any of our uh, alum or students, that's what they'll tell you. And as I said, because it's such a small industry, you keep running into your, um, your colleagues as you go through this. I just met, uh, do you remember Laura? Laura McEwen, I think it was, 2017. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. met her. I haven't yeah. seen her for years. The role. Oh. I didn't know it was role. No. Or, no. Where was she working? <laughs> She's with um, MECP now in their policy. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, very cool. Sorry. I know the name. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the history of finance? No, um, environment. 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 Artists. Yeah. Of her, you know, yeah. 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 So anyways, you like I haven't seen her for years and run into her at a meeting. So it was pretty, pretty nice to see these folks everywhere. Yeah, I meet them quite a bit at different meetings. Yeah. Different people. You, will, it's you always great. see them. Yeah. yeah. Um, the MFCs cluster in a place talking to each other. Yeah. Some of them don't know each other. They live different years, but they, they have, have a lot to connect. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other few things that uh, students really like, we have lots of field work. You may or may not like that. Um, but you do spend a lot of time outside. We've actually increased the amount of uh, time we're spending in the field both in our winter camp and in our fall camps. So we think those skills are really important for students to have and be comfortable working in the forest. Right? Uh, what else do we have? We have, um, as I mentioned, field camps. We have three field camps. We have a, a fall, summer, and winter field camp. Talk a little bit more in detail about those. We also have a guaranteed summer internship which I think is a real big asset for students that haven't had a lot of experience in forestry. It certainly gets them out meeting stakeholders. It gets them comfortable in the bush, working in the forest or bush. It could be urban forestry doing inventories here or, or in a different municipality. Um, but it just gives you that extra um, comfort level in the field once you've worked in it for the three or four month internship. We have two different ways to do the um, program. And one is, our, our normal one is 16 months. And we also offer an extended, which is the 16 months plus one year. So you can take a little bit longer to do it. Um, this is good for people that have to maybe work and fit it into their schedule or have family commitments or something like that. The extended program is, is helpful in that way. 
So this is the general course or program description. You take um, 7.5 uh, FCEs. Most of the courses are core courses that you need to take or need to complete. There is um, one FCE, so two half courses of elective that you can take anywhere. You can take in botany or you can take French language if that's something that you think will help your career, whatever it may be. Um, a lot of students take uh, geography, GIS, maybe planning. Depends on your interests and why. We also have electives in forestry. We have forest fire science. What else do we have? Urban forestry. Urban, urban forestry. Courses, uh, yeah. Or you could even take what we call a self directed course where you say, hey, I'm really interested in entomology, but there's no grad course in it. So you approach Sandy and say, I want to do something in entomology, and she would design a small project course for you to do. So all our professors are open to that as well. Um, so well, the <laughs> thank you. Um, where was I? Okay. The, the third thing was that again we do a lot of practical field work. Um, all of a number of courses have uh, components that are field work. Sean's course is applied forest ecology and silviculture. He's got Field, will you go out for a few days during that course? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of field trips. Yeah, as well as urban forest trips. Yeah. yeah. So each course will have some field trips or a practical component. The big one in the fall is biodiversity of forest organisms, where you go to Halliburton for nine days and um, cover all aspects of forestry. Uh, sort of biodiversity is the, the key word here in entomology, in plants, in soils, in trees. Um, so you really cover sort of the, the gamut of in fungi. Uh, you, you cover all organisms in the forest. Um, so I mentioned the guaranteed internship. We can talk a bit more about that after. And then in the winter term, there's a field trip to the Canadian Ecology Centre, which is in Mattawa, which is just outside of North Bay. And there you do you do some, um, some field visits, but you also do some field exercises in the winter. So if you need snowshoes or whatever it is, right? You, you they, we outfit you and you go out and do some forest measurements um, with your snowshoes or whatever the conditions may be. It may not have snow this year. Who knows? Oh, I think. You think there will be. <laughs> <laughs> Different up there, right? Always there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then in the summertime, there's either an urban or uh, international field camp. And I'm going to cover those in a minute. So if you're looking for a global perspective, rather than just more of a Canadian or North American perspective, you can gain that through the field camp by going on the international. You can do an international internship. Um, and as well, you can take things like tropical forestry or whatever your interests are to give you that global perspective. I know a um, number of years ago, that was really a big interest of many students was sort of more of a global look at forestry. And so that's very uh, doable in the program. So this is just a uh, um, photo actually of the Halliburton camp. Has anybody been to Halliburton? Have you been there? Like when I was a kid, we drove through. Yeah, yeah. So you have an idea of where it is. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, very big. I yeah, guess. that's okay. Yeah. So it's about two and a half hours north of here, northeast, and um, it's a beautiful location. We actually stay in Halliburton Forest, which is a. Um, it also has recreation there. They have a forestry operation, but they also do recreation. So there's tons of trails, tons of lakes, uh, beautiful area. And uh, yeah, you do all kinds of forest uh, measurement, learn forest measurement techniques, learn, as I said, about entomology, fungi, plants. And um, it's a chance to bond, really, to get to know your classmates. 
you have some fireside conversations, uh, chat about different aspects of forestry. It's a it's a really um, great experience. I've, I've never heard any student come back and say I didn't like it. <laughs> no, seriously, in, in all the years I've been here, I've never heard that. Heard what? Did I? That they it? didn't like the Halliburton Field Camp. Oh no! Yes. I've no, never <laughs> never heard an inkling of that. Sometimes the food wasn't the greatest, right? Yeah, that's you right. and I complain, but we complain, but maybe no one else. <laughs> so yeah, here's just some, these students are learning to, um, some orientation, learning to use the compass. There's Paul in the back there. <laughs> this is Paul, everyone. <laughs> Paul's making sure they do it right. Yeah. yeah. Here they're doing some, uh, I guess it's diameter sizing with the prisms. And there's Sean, who we just saw. <laughs> so Sean, yeah. Sean goes up. There you are. <laughs> Sean goes up to do the ecology and plants uh, section of the uh, of the uh, field course. So each prof will go up for a day or so, teach their specialty, and then come back. And that's. Uh, that's Daniela on the left and Jay. Um, Jay used to be our wildlife. He's retired. Daniela is still here. She does uh, urban forestry mainly. Um, here she's doing soils and uh, showing the students different uh, soil types in the forest. And that's from Jay. So you can see the little mole and that's there. And uh, yeah, so here's the students. They collected all these fungi and um, then they have to take them back and identify them. So they learn how to identify them through books and keys and uh, with the help of the experts that are there. And then they also do, um, we look at the practical aspects of forestry or the economic aspects of forestry. So learn how the timber is taken to the mills, what the value of the timber is, how it's processed. There's actually a sawmill very close to the forest where they harvest the logs in Halliburton and take it to this uh, sawmill. So you'll learn how they process the wood and how they grade it and evaluate it. Um, this was always my favorite part. I only went on it twice, but it was great. Um, do a, a canoe trip through the, uh, the lakes there. So it's quite beautiful. And, uh, Go, go through beaver dams. It's uh, it's not sort of an easy trip at times. Um, I don't know. Do students still tip? When I was there, there were like a lot of maybe two or three years ago. We had one actually a canoe expert, canoe expert. <laughs> tip. Any tip? tip. <laughs> <laughs> he was showing off a bit. Yeah, <laughs> but normally but you're not know, seeing them no. tip now. Yeah. The year I was there, a few tips. Oh yeah, actually. wasn't my fault. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, so lots of time for socializing, getting to know one another. This is just in the middle of um, the day. Um, Tony brings a beautiful lunch out for everyone and a uh, bit of time to relax and go swimming some years if the weather's nice. So then that nice part ends and you have to come <laughs> back to, uh, to the class. And um, this is your first term. It's I must say it's quite uh, rigorous, so you don't have a lot of extra time. You're pretty involved in these courses. Sometimes it doesn't look like much, but it's a lot. Uh, the good thing is you do work in teams a lot. So you work with your 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 fellow uh, classmates. And uh, I mean, that always makes things a little bit more interesting and fun. Um, so you take a variety of subjects. Current issues actually is a is a great first course. Um, Sandy teaches that, and uh, in that course we bring in stakeholders from all across the um, the forest conservation world. Uh, everything from indigenous industry, NGOs, the conservation world, urban, the municipalities, the conservation authorities. Yeah. So whoever's working internationally too, if there's a appropriate you know, international colleague. So you really get to see the breadth of the profession. Um, there is some, sorry, the last one, uh, analytical methods. So we do do some stats and GIS with you to, it's not advanced, it's sort of get everybody on a page where they can do some stats and GIS, because not everybody comes in with that background.
And those are important skills to have in forestry. The second semester, which is now the winter term, again, some more um, courses. This would be a chance to take uh, one of the electives. And this is also the time that the uh, students go to the Mattawa um, Ecology Center. Okay, with that picture. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is the, that's Brian Naylor on the right, and he's with the ministry. So he's taking the students out and doing some uh, tree marking and some measurements with the students. Yeah, I was, <laughs> there's Christine and Steph there. Um, I always tell the story about this one because we tried to get into a site. Tony go back up the hill. Yeah. <laughs> we go up in these vans and we couldn't make it up the hill. The vans are all swerving down the hill. And uh, finally the ministry said, Well, you guys don't have the right chains. I don't know what we needed. But anyways, they picked us all up in the back of their van and they shuttled the whole class up the hill in their van. So kind of may do. As I said, it's not sort of for the, the faint of heart, these <laughs> trips. You have to be a little bit resilient. Um, here's a picture. I think this is at the Sugar Shack. Um, again, you do some exercises. There. This is at Petalawa, I think. And yeah. is that? I'm pretty right. sure. Yeah. yeah. So you, you travel from Mattawa to Petalawa. Um, do some snowshoeing, and uh, this is, a, as I said, a sugar shack that they, they take us to. So then in the summer, you do uh, the field camp. So it's a two-week field camp, either international or urban. This year, we're going back to Costa Rica. Um, every few years, it changes. We've been doing Costa Rica for a few years now. Um, probably will change in the next year or so, I think see uh, it's worked well and I think that's why we, we've stayed with it for a few years the other option is a urban forestry trip and that trip goes from stays in Toronto area sort of York region Oakville Mississauga for one week and then goes off to travels towards Ottawa Montreal I think is the end destination so you get a week on the road and a week in Toronto or sort of southern uh, Toronto, greater Toronto area. Um, the other thing that happens in the summer, once you come back from the field camp, is the internship. The internship is very uh, personalized. It's every student goes somewhere else. I don't think I've ever had two students going to the same place. And it's based on what your interests are and where you want to go. Um, we get internship requests from our from organizations, but we also go out and look for internships. If you want to work in a certain area um, or with a certain organization, we've probably got a contact there and can help um, procure an internship for you. So we work together on that. And that takes place from June right through to August. Um, this is just an idea of where we've been for our international field camps. So I'm not sure if we will change next year or whether it'll be Costa Rica. It could be anywhere. We've been to Africa, we've been to Nepal, um, New Zealand, been to a couple of places in the US, Brazil a number of times, China a number of times as well. These are just some uh, pictures of the field camps. This one was from Brazil. The uh, group actually met with the Keapo uh, indigenous group. So, just wanted to give you an idea of the agenda um, for the uh, Malaysia field camp. This was actually Sean's, I believe. Just to show you sort of the diversity of where you would go and what you would do. These are to me like a once in a lifetime uh, type of trip because you're not just going sightseeing, you're actually getting to meet and talk to people on the ground doing the work, doing forest conservation in these areas, which you would never have the opportunity to do if you were just going as a tourist. Um, so you do everything from, as I said, indigenous groups, conservation groups, NGOs, you go to industry, this one went to rubber tree plantations, so things you would never you know, have access to or be able to see. 
And then again, some there's always time for some fun activities on each of these um, these trips. So this trip actually uh, went to a couple different sites. Some pictures of if Sean was here, he could have told us what we're looking at because. And um, yeah, something we added in the recent years is uh, both the field camps, the field trips do a uh, research blitz where the professor gives you a problem um, in that uh, locality, in that uh, area, and it separates you into teams. And then it's up to each team to design experiments, do the experiment, and then present results in, I think it's one in two days. So you're trying to solve some of the challenges that the uh, the local um, local people are having. So it could be a social issue. It could be a, a you know a, a forest conservation issue. This one was, I think, for um, just a restoration, not just, but a restoration project they were doing. Just pictures. Yeah, lots of time for conversation always around the areas and uh, sort of problems and uh, and solutions for these different uh, different issues that the areas are facing. Oops. Yeah. yeah, so this next one is just the urban forestry trip, just to give you an idea there. As I mentioned, they stay in Toronto for a little while um, and then venture to sort of uh, York region, Richmond Hill, Oakville, then on to Ottawa and Montreal. Those are some of the, uh, the spots they look at or visit. That's the route. Just again, just some photos of some of the things that they would be looking at for the urban trip, um, looking at some of the horticulture, um, looking at uh, problems like uh, emerald ash borer, how do, how do municipalities manage for that? How, what's the liability issues? You know, Do they go in and take out all the ash? Do they leave some? Sort of how do you manage for these really um, risky and big problems that are, have, have hit us? Go to some nurseries, see how trees are grown. Uh, this is really, now moving on to the internships. As I mentioned, I think um, the internships can be anywhere in the world, as long as it's safe. Um, that bottom one was in Brazil, it was with the Keapo. The one up top was just this last summer. Um, Stevie went to Northern Manitoba and spent a few months with um, a First Nations group up there looking at their indigenous plants and how to how to manage forest operations so that you could conserve these uh, these valuable plants um, for the community. These are some of the host organizations. This is just a handful um, that our students have gone to or do go to. We have internships with the same organizations every year. For example, City of Toronto, uh, City of Mississauga almost every year, MNR, so the Ministry of Natural Resources, we have students going to. We have students in Parks Canada every year, uh, Toronto District School Board for before my time, um, so probably for 20 years now, I don't say, with long time. Uh, also with private companies, we've had students with um, some of the big Horticulture uh, companies like Conan Masters, um, pretty much anything involved in forestry. And I can tell you, as you were speaking, I just received a text from Emily Weathers, mm -hmm. former MFC, and she's saying that they're looking for MFCs. I don't know, a company Meadowway? Meadowway, there. Mackenzie, BC, Central BC. So, yeah. Just we, came, came out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's what sort of perpetuates our internships is once our students get jobs, which they seem to be quite successful at, they come back and ask for, for interns. So a lot of our internships are going to 
organizations where the MFC is the host. So it's great because they know how to mentor you and know what you need to know. So that's been, for me, a really uh, great part of this program is that they stay in touch with us, to sort of keep uh, supporting the program in that way. So again, these are just another list of, um, of where our students go for the summer. Halliburton Forest every year, we've had a student there for quite a while, LEAP, um, another organization. Okay, so that brings us then to the final semester, which is really, I've got to change that title. That's actually a forest uh, planning course now, that top one. Um, and then you, sorry, that's, those two courses have changed. changed, yeah. But they're like, basically but... doing the same thing. Um, so you have two really big courses, important courses, where you're doing a capstone project, and you're also doing a forest management plan in the other one. So again, these are skills that you need to get your RPF status. So they're very important courses. Um, and they integrate sort of everything you've learned up to date. That's really the good part of them. You take all your knowledge and, and produce some really, um, really cool um, projects. Uh, these are then presented. The capstone papers, which are based on your internship, are presented to a group of um, host organizations. Um, a lot of uh, our stakeholders come to watch these presentations because it's really giving people an idea of what's going on in the industry. So we have people from the uh, municipalities who come and, and there's quite a big urban forestry uh, concentration on one day. So we'll have people from uh, Oakville and Sasaga and the city of Toronto. And um, they watch these presentations because they want to learn sort of the latest and greatest of what, what we're working on. So it's, it's quite a, a great event. It's a, usually a three day, two or three day event. Okay, now down to the sort of nitty gritty of getting into the program. Um, so we, we encourage and, and like to have students from different disciplines. We don't necessarily, you don't have to have a BSc. Um, we're open to any degree and we've had probably <laughs> almost any, any degree. <laughs> Uh, and all students have done done well and been successful. Uh, we've had fine arts students, uh, we've had music students, business students, engineers, lawyers, lawyers, <laughs> yeah, a couple, uh, teachers, um, BAs, BSCs. So we're really retirees. <laughs> retirees. We had a seventy five year old gentleman who took the program. Um, yeah, so retired engineers. Retired engineer. He was a physicist. I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, we're really open because we think that enhances the class to have that diversity. Um, you know, different viewpoints, different abilities, that just makes the class and the program stronger. So we encourage people from all disciplines. You need to have a mid B in both years, or both of your last two years. That's what we ask for. If you don't have it in both, you know, still apply. If you have other qualities that we evaluate, we're happy to um, to admit students even if they didn't have a B in their third year. Uh, the reference reports. Hopefully, you can get a academic report from a couple of references. I know it's not easy sometimes, especially with COVID and being online, you know, you don't get to know profs too well. But for those of you in third year, it's a good idea if you're thinking of graduate school to get to know a prof, go to their office hours, talk to them, um, because it's important to have uh, references. Uh, we asked for a letter of interest. So what have you done that um, relates to forestry? Why do you want to come into this program? You know, what is it that, where's your career going? Where do you see yourself going? Those are things we want to hear about. Why are you passionate about forestry or forest conservation? Uh, your CV and uh, transcript. So the early application date was January 3rd. Um, and that sort of... Um, those applications were that were completed for January 10th 
are all being reviewed now, and we will be offering letters of acceptance to that first group of applicants that came in. If you didn't get your application in by then, that's fine. Uh, you can, the sooner you get it in, the sooner we will review it and get back to you. The final deadline to have everything in is April 15th. So after that date, they probably won't uh, accept any more uh, applications. So you have to have all your information in by April 15th. Um, as far as uh, bursaries or scholarships, there's um, some internal admission scholarships, usually between. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so April 15th is the deadline for the fall 2024 start. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Very absolutely. Yeah. That everything has to be in. Yeah. Um, so all your letters of reference yeah. have to be received, your letter of interest. And Does maybe I should also mention for any. U of T students for your official transcript, you can just download your ACORN PDF and use that. They might ask you for an official transcript later on, but if you're applying, yeah. use that. Don't pay for the yeah. official one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Absolutely fine. Um, so there is some uh, some admission scholarships. Usually they're between, I'd say, three and five thousand dollars, depending on how many students we have. Um, there's some in-course awards uh, for doing the best in certain courses. There's uh, probably three or four thousand dollars over the course of the program. Um, just this is a rough estimate. The approximate cost for the program is about twenty thousand dollars, including the field camps. Okay, don't quote me. Look into it yourself and make sure the the fees. Don't know if there's any international students um, online or or here. Um, same requirements basically. The, the the kind of nice part of this is that you're um, also eligible to apply for a postgraduate uh, work permit, and it's the it's equivalent to the length of the program. So because our program's sixteen months. After you graduate, you can get a 16 month uh, work visa. So that's kind of a nice add. Um, the cost is exorbitant. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. And um, again, you have to provide for travel and living to get here. Uh, same consideration for financial support uh, as far as our scholarships go, go to the international students. Sometimes we recommend that if you can to seek uh, opportunities for funding in your home country, there may be opportunities to study abroad. And check out the U of T Award Explorer and just see what's out there. There's always different awards depending on your background or yeah, your interest. Like what scam or that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely worthwhile. So again, just to... Uh, to put it in writing, here's some of the student backgrounds, but as I said, we're open to all students. These are ones that just came to mind. And um, employers, so so where do you get a job when you complete this program? Um, seeing a bit of a shift in this, actually, uh, and I wish we had some really up-to-date numbers, yeah, but we yeah. don't. So we're starting to see more going to like federal um, provincial, municipal governments. Uh, we're now seeing, used to be that we would see our students in the Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, now we're seeing them going into the Ministry of Environment. So all of a sudden they figured out that, hey, forests and the environment, they kind of are important. <laughs> we need that knowledge. Um, so we're seeing them ending up in ministry and um, what's the other one? The feds called the well, the Canadian Wildlife Services is where triple E C, yeah, it's the funny thing, yeah, triple E C, that's it's like climate change, yeah. and yeah, triple C, or whatever. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, I forget the, the, the federal, yeah, federal H -H names, every couple years. yeah, <laughs> but it's something to do with climate change and the environment. Um, and they're the ones now that are looking, oh, well, forestry actually is important here, so they're hiring their students. Municipal governments have sort of blown up. I don't know how many the city of Toronto have of our 
MFCs, there must be probably 20 to 30. Yeah. Um, when I started, yeah. there was like a couple. <laughs> so, you know, that's really York Region, another one. The county forests. And the yeah, forest. forests. And, so yeah. The, the federal one is now the Ministry of Environment and Climate like change. change. And that was, I guess, he made, yeah, in ACC. October 2021. Yeah. So, yeah, depends who's in government. They like to <laughs> sort of reorientate. Yeah. yeah. But needless to say, we're not just in the natural resources anymore. We're now in the environment sector, which is really a nice thing yeah, to see, finally. And yeah. I was going to say, like, beyond, because it, they, they realize in those environmental sector, sectors and in conservation that they want students with skill sets that forestry brings. They're not just general environmental science and studies and sort of theoretical thinking. It's actually hands-on with skills of yeah. how to get metrics and build data and support their work. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. That's what we deliver is, is skills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's great to see. And as I said just the other day, running into more and more students with the government these days. So kind of cool. Um, that's why I was going to say industry has kind of slipped. Uh, we used to maybe get two or three students that would say, I want to work in the forest industry, would head out to BC, do a few years or stay there for, for their careers. But um, last couple of years, no, no one's there. really gone out there. So well, Brian, Brian's moving up. Is he Brian? Do you remember Brian? Brian Liu? Brian, Brian. Yeah, yeah, he did. He didn't. He didn't he went with Sean's project, yeah. But he's not working. He is, it is with industry, you're right, a different kind of industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's doing restoration out there. I think some of it is, it's not the traditional it's forestry. Forest, right? yeah. I was thinking even the Ontario Woodlot Association, like Glenn Primo, and, there, and he was an engineer coming in, but are, are able to work here. It's not so much the big crown forest. forest yeah. It is more about private land and public. Yeah. So there's a bit of a shift in where yeah. the students are, are working. Yeah. Um, yeah, and here's just, again, another sort of illustration of some of the places where our students are. And they're still with the big uh, NGOs and... Uh, yeah. Ontario Nature, there's... I think Canada, there's a number of... Forest Forest Ontario. Ontario. Yeah. Na Ontario a, that's what I was going to say. There's a lot of NGOs. There's a more diversity in the, the not for profit sector that that's diversifying. And so, for sure, students really graduates yeah. fit there. LEAF is another one we, uh, we've had students yeah. up for yeah, number in there. So, that's the end of the formal presentation. And uh, again, open to any questions you may have. Um, Specific or detail? What's the story that was like a If you can get a couple academic, that's really helpful. And what about uh, two academic and one career? That's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, anyone online have a question? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to get, you know, well, I was, I was thinking more of the non-academic. If you've been out working, then that's easier. But we always like at least one, if not two academics, to more to comment on how you're going to do in the program. Like they know what it is to be in a university program, um, whereas non-academics don't really, can't gauge that, all they can gauge is sort of your work ethics and responsibilities, so it's really nice to have at least one or two academics that kind of, they did okay in my course, I thought they were great, and or they may have had more connection with me. Okay, I have a question from Taylor online. Are we able to take electives with a law focus, or is it strictly arts and science relating to environment? You can take any course that the School of Graduate Studies offers. So they have a, a large calendar, 
Um, you can go online and look to see what the law department or law faculty offers. Um, so if you can meet the requirements, you can certainly take those courses. Um, but there are, if you're looking for policy, there's policy courses in the environmental um, the school, the environment, <laughs> yeah, policy type courses. Yeah. So environmental law, yeah, it's available. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question online. I know some U of T graduate courses offer some collaborative studies. Is this possible with this program, or is it too intensive to mix with other departments? That's a great question because I didn't mention no, it. Yet. No, so <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> thank you. That was a paid question. Uh, <laughs> we actually do have two collaborative programs. One is the um, with the environmental uh, science school, school of, of the environment. environment. Thank you. And um, you don't actually have to take any extra courses. You just have to take courses that fill. Um, a niche in both programs. So for example, they need a capstone project or, or thesis, and the one you do in our program will meet that requirement. I think they have a seminar course that you need to take, and you can take that as an elective, which counts for us as an elective and counts for them as their core, core requirements. So um, yeah, once you're here, you can, uh, Laura's actually the one who helps to make sure <laughs> that you're taking the right courses and, and linked up with them. The other one is with the School of Public Health. Yeah, the Environmental Health. Yeah, and I'm not sure what that one's called, but it's, it's the same arrangement. So it's more to do with public health or, or to do with health, um, human. human health. <laughs> and um, yeah, same arrangement. So you don't have to take extra courses. You just have to make sure you're taking the right electives um, to meet both the uh, both program requirements. And that's to the Dalla right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess um, just Janice asking. So just to confirm. Yes, you can just fill your electives from the collaborative program. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I obviously wasn't very clear. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? Um, what is the expected enrollment for the fall 2024 entry? Is it similar to the 18, as you said earlier, or 30? I um, say it's going to be in between uh, 2025, where I see it. I'd be optimistic at 25, 30, but we'll see. Yeah. You, you could never target these specifically. It's hard so. to tell. I mean, you put out a number of offers and then students can accept or decline. So you can never really tell no. where that number is going to end up. But. but it has to be between 25 and 30. 30 is our max. Max. Yeah. At what point would you get all of them? 30, 34. Yeah, that's too many. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone accepted. <laughs> <That'd be awesome. laughs> well, there's benefits to both sides the way I see yeah, it. Because it a small it group, is. you get more one on one time. But yeah. with a larger group, then you get close with more people, people that later on in your career. Good networking. Yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah, it's not that huge, really. No. Because no. there's small people get moved around in different teams. So even if there was 30, you're often working with a set of four here or a different set, set of three there and they change. And so you kind of get to know everyone. Yeah. And it's small and props deal with it. That's yeah. not over 30, but that was bad. <laughs> but it's really good, um, you know, not only to get to know your own, your colleagues, but to get to know the props. Yeah. So I think, that's yeah. one thing our students, again, they always say, well, it's great. We're a small faculty. I know all the profs. They can come to us for references for right. later on in their life. And uh, we're happy to do that. Online question. If we were to take the 28-month part-time option, how do we fit lectures into a regular nine-to-five work schedule? So that one's called extended. It's not part-time. So it's just uh, 12 months uh, in addition to the uh, 16 months. Thank you for coming. And um, you can work into a nine to five. That's not a problem. Um, the courses are all offered nine to five. So I don't. Maybe it was the opposite, the conflict with 
If you're working in nine and five. Yeah. Oh, if you're yeah, working yeah, nine yeah, and five. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think that would be really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Because the courses are all offered basically during the day. They're not uh, online. They're in person. So it would be really difficult. You'd have to do a really strategic. Yeah, maybe extended. one day. That would be more or of a discuss part time. Part -time. Yeah, that's disgusting. Got it. I'll quit my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might want to think about the um the part time. Yeah. yeah. Um. So we take very few students part time, but if you have a really um great reason for us to accept you, um, we will consider it. And that way, you maybe come down to school one day a week. And, um, you know, over a much longer period of time. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about that if, uh, if you want to talk one on one. Yeah, so Jan or anyone, if you just uh, email Sally and you guys can yep. figure things Set up out. an yeah. appointment to chat about <laughs> any specifics. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it for questions. Thank everybody for coming. Appreciate you taking the time to find out. And if you're not in your last year, um, you've got lots of time to come back and ask us questions. <laughs> yeah, so feel free to email us. And then if we don't know, then we will all send you to the people who do know. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. Good. Okay, thank you. There should be donuts left except for Sean. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Our professor's Asian donuts. <laughs>